It's Wednesday, July 8th, 2020. Digital Trends Live is about to start here. Some of the topics we're covering on today's episode of the show, the backlash against how Facebook moderates content on its site continues with a scathing auto report and a meeting with the Stop Hate for Profit organizers that didn't go too well. And we have a great lineup of guests on the show, starting with two-time NBA champion and now an Emmy Award-winning broadcaster on Inside the NBA. We've got Kenny the Jet Smith, plus you may know of a little show called The Office, and today we'll have Leslie David Baker, otherwise known as Stanley Hudson, on to talk about his campaign to create Uncle Stan the series. And NASA recently announced that it'll be renaming its headquarters in D.C. after legendary engineer Mary W. Jackson, and we'll have Michelle Farabee here to talk about her impact on space exploration. All of that and more on today's episode of Digital Trends Live. Hello, everyone. This is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. And again, thank you for joining us wherever you are. We appreciate it. We broadcast live here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. So thanks for being a part of the show today. Let's get you started with some tech news to start your day off. And we're going to talk about Facebook right now, certainly in the news for a number of reasons, but it has to do with their content moderation policies and some of the backlash against that. There's an audit report that just came out that's been a two-year process that Facebook initiated through a third party that came back to analyze how they handle political posts how they handle hate speech, and the audit report is not good. Uh, so this came back, it's a 100-page evaluation that says Facebook repeatedly contradicted its own policies, enabling malicious actors to abuse its platform for spreading hate, discrimination, and more. So this uh, certainly follows along with some of the political posts and their stance of not having a stance on it and allowing political posts to go forward, whether it's misinformation or not, uh, saying that they want to be hands off. And this is part of that. Uh, they said that in particular, this political interference is something that uh, Facebook needs to rectify. And again, this is an audit that came out uh, today, really. And it's a two year long process that analyzed what they've been doing. So there were some uh, civil rights experts, uh, Laura W. Murphy and Megan Cacasey, uh, who talked about this. And uh, and yeah, it's not, not coming back very good for them. The report argues that Facebook's approach to civil rights remains too reactive and piecemeal. This also comes on the heel of yesterday with a meeting that went forward with the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. This is a campaign of organizations who want to uh, instigate a widespread ad boycott on Facebook. And they've been very successful so far. There's a lot of companies that have stopped advertising on Facebook. Um, and finally, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, COO uh, Sheryl Sandberg met with the organizers of that campaign to see if they could find some way forward. And the response from the Stop Hate for, uh, Stop Hate for Profit campaign was that um, it essentially felt like, according to them, a PR exercise. They did not feel that uh, their issues were addressed and that they are hoping that something can go forward from there. But uh, that is what they are reporting. Again, that's the Stop Hate for Profit. Now, as far as Facebook, their response is uh, essentially just to um, paraphrase just a little bit, bit of it. They said that they believe that uh, they'll follow some of these recommendations in a blog post here. As Cheryl Sandberg said uh, that Facebook won't make every change they call for but it has begun putting into practice some of the proposals. So a lot going on right there, a lot to follow up on. You can read more about that at digitaltrends.com. Continuing on here with trending news, uh, Samsung made an announcement about their Unpacked event. This was something we actually talked about yesterday on the show with the rumors of the new Note 20 Ultra, and we are going to get that event. It is going to be happening on August 5th. So this is just like everything else, going to be all online, but it's going to be uh, Samsung announcing their new uh, products that are going to be coming out. And so we do anticipate that's going to be the Note 20, Note 20 Ultra, and all the things that go along with that. There's some renderings that actually came out from Samsung. They accidentally posted those, but now kind of the cat's out of the bag. Uh, we've got a lot of write-ups about this at digitaltrends.com, and our own Andy Boxall kind of went through what the rumors are and what we expect, but I do expect a lot more information to come out about that over the next uh, few weeks here as we get ready for that on August. 5th. All right. Again, continuing on here with news at the top of the show, let's talk about a Tinder update. And this is certainly a sign of the times when we're in a pandemic and people can't really go out and meet each other quite the same. Tinder has finally added on their video calling feature. And this is something I announced, I believe it was a couple of months ago, back in May. Um, time has no meaning anymore, right? So back in May uh, is when they announced that they were going to be rolling this out, and now it is out. So this is a video calling feature that will allow people to have interactions with that. Uh, you will have to have both people opt in, so you can't just get an unannounced 
phone call from someone, a video call. And then there's also different things that they're going to have. They said that you can uh, enable or disable a feature. So you can disable it if you want. They're going to have a 50-50 split screen. So both people on the screen at the same time. And then they'll have uh, even things like a, a, a quiz afterward asking how the call went after you both hang up. Now, this is not going to be rolling out to everybody yet. It is just going to be in certain areas. Certain countries are going to have it. In the U.S., it's going to be Virginia, Illinois, Georgia, and Colorado for now. But then they'll be rolling out the face-to-face -face video feature uh, further past that. We're uh, in contact with Tinder to try to get some of the updates as far as when that's going to roll out everywhere. But right now, that is where they're at. And uh, definitely, a, like I said, a, a side of the times. Other dating apps do have this already. Um, other applications and social interactions are available on other apps. But Tinder now bringing this with this video calling feature. Check out more about that at digitaltrends.com. All right, getting you your news here. Let's... Talk about Amazon. Now, naturally, a lot of us are streaming content at home, and Amazon has finally updated some of their features for Prime Video. One being that you can now have different profiles on there. So if you're at home and you've got several people using it, I'm thinking of people with kids, and you're tired of having some of the same recommendations come up for them, and you want your own, well, now you can set up your own profiles, and you can actually have uh, different levels of access to what shows show up for kids with those profiles so that would prevent them from seeing some things they shouldn't see so they said that this is going to be rolling out to uh, every prime video platform so that includes web android ios fire tv playstation 4 all the other ones that you can watch it on we can set up up to six profiles that you can have set up on there and you could also stream content on three different devices uh, and uh, so and also uh, no more than two devices streaming the same video at the same time so that's where they're at with that but that does allow for more people to be utilizing uh, this and so again <clears throat> excuse me it is the uh, Amazon uh, allowing more Amazon profiles they also uh, unveiled watch party which is a group watching feature that was a couple of weeks ago where they had that so that more people can watch it at the same time and have a social viewing experience and again that's Amazon Prime Video updating their uh, package right there so that is six different profiles now that you can set up on that we've got more about that at digitaltrends.com and finally let's talk about Sporting events. We know that some things here in the United States are going to be opening up pretty soon, but worldwide we have some other events that have been happening. But naturally, crowds are not present at the majority of these things. And here is an example of what we could have in store if uh, SoftBank has their way. So this is in Japan, and uh, SoftBank is the owner of the Spot Robot and the Pepper Robots and all kinds of robots. And they set up their own cheering section right there for a baseball game. So this is with Pepper... Pepper and Spot Robots, all in coordination. It gives me nightmares every time I see this. But that is what they are doing uh, to showcase support for their team. And it's going to be interesting to see how other, how other uh, organizations, I can't even look at that, how other organizations do this and how they're going to handle their crowds uh, when it comes to how you add in that atmosphere for a game. We're going to be talking about that with Kenny Smith here in just a little bit. I have a couple questions for him about it. But uh, there it is, some robots there for the Japanese baseball team. You can read more about that at digitaltrends.com. It's now time for the, the product, product of, of the, the day. day. Yes, our product of the day is the Chromebook 3100 2-in-1 Education Edition. So this is in particular designed for education. It's designed for kids or for people who maybe are prone to dropping their laptop because it's got a very rugged design. That's one of the key points of it. It's an 11 inch two in one and it's got a 13 hour battery life, but that it, the real feature here is the fact that it's rigorously tested. So it tested to, to survive 5,000 free fall micro drops and 30 inch drops onto steel. So they really bang this thing up to see if it would handle it. It can survive spills. It's got protected ports. So you can plug things in and out uh, all you want without bending that or breaking it. So that's really what the big feature here, here is. And again, it's Chrome OS and it is starting right now at $369. So you can take a look right there at the link that we're gonna have. So it'll either be below me or to the side of me and you follow that link and you can take advantage of that deal. But again, the durability is the big, big selling feature here. Dropped 5,000 times and still kept on working. So that is something that even if you're not a kid, maybe that's something that you need yourself. So again, that is our product of the day. All right, let's continue on here with Digital Trends Live. We have an action-packed show. We're going to get to a break because coming up next, we have Kenny the Jet Smith to talk about the NBA and the Jet Academy. Stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live.
Welcome back to Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thanks for being here with us. And our next guest is a two-time NBA champion. He is an Emmy Award-winning host of Inside the NBA and the founder of the Jet Academy. We have Kenny the Jet Smith here with us right now. Kenny, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk to you. I've got a few questions for you here. I want to talk about some NBA basketball, but I want to talk about your academy first because this is a really interesting thing that you have going here this year. And I wonder if you could tell us about the founding of this and what it is that you're bringing to the table this year for everybody. Yeah, I love you. I love what you have under it. It's bringing basketball to kids worldwide. I was thinking about, you know, social distancing. I was thinking about COVID and I said, well, why should it stop the development or the urge to pick up a basketball and play? and have a good time doing it. You know, if you're middle school or your AAU team or your high school team, why should it stop your development? So I created the uh, Jet Academy and uh, it's the first virtual online basketball camp uh, where you sign up and uh, for two and a half hours, I mean an hour and a half rather, you know, myself, Trey Young, or NBA All-Star, Kemba Walker, NBA All-Star, Victor Oladipo, uh, and WNBA P, uh, MVP, Brittany, uh, uh, St Brianna Stewart and Brittany Griner. We're your post personal coaches for an hour and a half in the, uh, in the day. And uh, it, but the, what differentiates it, it's live. So everyone's live. You can ask live questions, li get live answers. You can upload your videos. So it's just an unbelievable way of something I, I probably should have done years ago to reach kids all around the world and, it, and it's jetacademycamp.com. Again, jetacademycamp.com. That's a I really fascinating setup. I was ready setup to show you some stuff. I was ready to show you some stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> by all means. You, yeah, if you want to show, please demonstrate no, for I me. I need the help. I show you. That's all right. You don't have your ball. Don't worry. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> Dang it. All right. I've got a flat one upstairs, but uh, okay. Something else I want to ask from the technical side of things. Um, how are you producing this? Because it's, I think having it live and, you know, we broadcast live here. What is the production like for you, for each one of these players? Do you have somebody filming them or what kind of setup do they work with? Well, you know, because of, you know, COVID, you know, and, um, you know, I have some really good friends in the tech world 
Um, and um, they're, I mean, extremely smart. One, a friend of mine, Guy Oseri, he and Aston Kutcher partners. And I just started picking his brain about some things. And so it's a streaming service that has been well, that we use um, at a lot of different places. It's been used at an NBA All-Star Weekend. A lot of times, concerts, Coachella. So I take that streaming service, but I, I just take it and I use it in different avenues. And so I, I set up multi-camera shoots and, and players' places. We, re, we remotely operate it. Um, it's like a two-hour TV show, uh, basically. And um, getting the guys to do it live in that thing, now we don't have to be there because we can remotely operate the cameras once they're set up at any time. All they have to do is be in front of, in, in, a, in a radius that we keep them. And, and they, they've all loved it. And uh, they all love the idea, so I got them to participate. Well, it's like you mentioned with that, you can reach so many more people going about it that way, you know, and, and being able to reach all these kids online around the world. I mean, that's awesome. Um, speaking of basketball, though, I got to talk to you about the NBA a little bit, the season, getting ready to start again, July 30th. What are you personally most excited for with this new strange style of, of play that we're going to be having? Well, I'm optimistic, but I'm also cautious, you know. It's the, you know, cautious and it's the most contagious virus that we've seen in our lifetime. Um, and the most deadly in our lifetime. So I'm really ca cautious, but optimistic that the players will be able to play. We could see the best players, no matter what. If you drop 350 of anything, they're 350 best players in the world. And if you drop 350 of the best anything in any place for a month and a half and have a competition, the winner comes out of it. You have to respect. So I'm just, I'm just loving the fact that we still will have best players in the world competing for something. Um, I, I don't feel it's an extension of last season. I just think it's a new format that's starting now. With normal NBA games, the fans are a huge part of the experience, that crowd noise, whether it's home crowd or away crowd. And with the lack of that, um, I want to know from you, how do you think that's going to affect the play on the court? I think it'll, I think it'll be different because – Certain players do have a, a certain sensitivity to crowd noise, uh, positively and negatively. So I do think that um, it will be different. You'll see certain guys step up their game in different levels that you probably did not expect uh, because of this lack of sensitivity of crowd noise. Uh, you know, there is a thing called home court advantage, and that's it. It's not because you sleep in your own bed. It's because it's also because of the, the, the atmosphere that's created by the road team. So uh, it will be a different environment uh, for certain guys and a little bit easier environment to play in front of and show your skills. Um, how do you think this is, or I guess, how is this going to work for broadcasters in general? Like for you, how is this going to be different? Well, for me, it's not different at all because we're typically in the Atlanta studio. So we watch, we watch the game. I critique it from, the, from there. I have, you know, different access cameras that I'll still have those. So I, I'm going to see the game the way I've been seeing it when I critique the game. So I think the most familiar thing will be the way our show looks. <laughs> that will be the most familiar thing. It'll look the same. We're pretty much going to be six feet away. You know, I'm going to run to the board. Things are going to be, I'm going to evaluate film direct. We're going to have jokes. Everything about our, our show is pretty much be the same based on the fact the nature of what we already have been doing. Nice. Uh, well, I want to say that, you know, your show with, with Ernie, with Chuck, with Shaq is the best broadcast crew on, on, on TV when it comes to sports. I mean, hands down, most entertaining. But I have a question for you. So uh, if there were a one-on-one -on -one tournament with the three of you, with Kenny, Chuck, and Shaq, who's going to win? Today? <laughs> right now. Oh, Today? Charles is out today. He wouldn't win today. Uh, Ernie's out, of course. So it'd be down to me and Shaq. And if we had a, a rule where you can only take three dribbles, I think I'd still, I could beat Shaq. But if he could take more than three dribbles, Shaq wins every time. <laughs> what about in the prime? Oh, uh, in the prime, uh, I, I would say in the prime, it would be Shaq easily. Uh, just because of his sheer size in a one-on-one. -on -one. He, he would have... Uh, he would have backed all of us down. We all would have needed help. The only way teams beat Shaquille O'Neal's teams is if they had help. That is true. Well, uh, 
Kenny, I want to say thank you very much for joining us. I want to remind everybody, too, again, so it's jetacademycamp.com. Everybody can go there, sign up. I, I looked at it, too. There's different structures, different pricing structures that you've got on there, different ways that people can interact, but you've got all these pros. Really unique experience. And thank you so much for being here on Digital Trends Live. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Kenny, the Jet Smith, right here on Digital Trends Live. That is awesome. Seriously, they are the best broadcast crew in the NBA and I think throughout sports. That's just my piece. we got to get going because we've got more coming up here on the show. If you're a fan of The Office, you're going to be excited about our next guest. We have Leslie David Baker, a.k.a. Stanley, who's joining us to talk about his new crowdfunding campaign to launch a new series. That's up next. Stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. This is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and thank you very much for joining us. But joining us right now, we have one of the stars of The Office. You know him as Stanley Hudson, and now he is continuing this saga with a crowdfunding campaign to launch an all-new series. We have Leslie David Baker here. Hello. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hello. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, there's so much excitement to talk to you right now, and I want to just start off with uh, if you could give us kind of a – Surmise of what Uncle Stan is really going to be about. What is the premise of this show? Okay, the premise of the show is it's uh, several years after uh, his retirement. Uh, Uncle Stan receives a call from his nephew, Lucky. Um, he's a recent widower with two small children, and he owns a bicycle repair shop. And his late wife owned a florist shop, which was attached uh, next door. So, um, Lucky calls his uncle and he's having financial troubles and he's having trouble with the kids and he's having, you know, all these difficulties that a new widower would have. And, you know, he calls his uncle and says, help. And Uncle Stan comes to the rescue to help. Now, Uncle Stan is engaged and, you know, his fiance is unaware that he's about to make such a large move. So he makes this move and comes to try to help out and get everything in order with the Stan uh, level of wisdom and guidance and tough love and the whole gamut. So we're tracing uh, the character of Stan's visit several years after his retirement. Uh, as you know, to retire or go somewhere else and get tired all over again, this will give Stan an opportunity to do just that. And after sitting up, 
you know, being a person of leisure, listening to old disco music and hanging out doing wood carvings for so many years, you can only have a diet of that for so long. And when an opportunity presents itself to start a new beginning, um, then that's what a person does. You know, so we decided to come up with this concept because I often heard at Comic Cons uh, what happened to the character of Stanley or what did he do? What was his journey? Uh, he didn't just cease to exist. Now, seven years later, you know, we get an opportunity to see what else does he do? What were his interests? Um, what has become of him? He didn't cease to exist simply because he retires. And this show will speak to a lot of retirees. Uh, what happens after you leave your corporate job? What type of life do you have? Uh, do your wishes, hopes, dreams, ambitions, do they change? Do they evolve? Of course they do. So we get a chance to see this through the character of Stan. Well, I think you brought up a good point there with uh, Comic-Con and we're just with people talking about Stanley and, and your character because it's so beloved. Everybody loved those characters on The Office and they want to know more. And I'm curious for you, if you can think of any other series you know that's that's been able to create so much content years afterwards because what you have a couple of podcasts you got brian baumgartner's uh an oral history of the office which is going to be coming out you got office ladies uh angela kinsey and jenna fisher is there any other show you can think of that inspired so many people to create these things years after the series ended uh not really because i think the office was so unique in that there was such a wide array of characters a wide variety of america represented by the show that everybody had an opportunity who watched the show to see somebody that they identified with they either worked with went to church school with um, these characters are so ingrained within our society that you can't help but wonder uh what's the next generation gonna see you know what are they going to have to say about these characters? How are they going to relate to these characters? We represent the working class of America. Um, we work, represent the parents of the working class of America. Um, their children are going to look at our what we've done on the office, and they're going to say, hmm, I wonder, is that what corporate America really is like? Is that what it represents? Um, what are we going to do? after that what happens after that so we move on uh with this one particular character that we may not have seen all of the insights during the initial show and we get to go to stanley you know uh what happens after that uh stan 2.0 um again what are his wishes hopes dreams ambitions how do his goals shift as he enters his quote golden years um you know, you don't just go home and die. And since the spirit of the office will never die, the spirit of these characters will never die. So we look forward and see what happens. When it comes to these characters, in particular Stanley Hudson, I wanted to ask a question of you. What do you think is the one piece of tech that Stanley would not be able to live without? The one piece of tech? Um, I think that we start to find out that uh, Stan, Uncle Stan likes his cell phone. And we, you know, you would think that having worked in an office setting for that many years, that he wouldn't like that, but he likes his uh, iPhone because it allows him to have a window to the world right in his pocket and it can go anywhere with him. So, um, I think that, that's great because I, I just remember, you know, his computer getting replaced. Um, a couple other questions here for you with this when it comes to, you know, this character and just such a beloved character. And obviously you're recognized everywhere. What is the one quote that people say to you the most when it comes to the character of Stanley Hudson? Uh, actually, there too. two. Um, Boy, have you lost your mind, um, which is one that I wrote when we were doing that particular episode um, when BJ, I thought he was um, trying to pursue my daughter. And um, did I stutter? Those are the two. Yes. Um, <laughs> another question here. We've got our uh, Riley Wynn, who is uh, one of our uh, co-workers okay. here I'm, at Digital I'm Tech. I'm listening a, big a little fan. bit because... There's a helicopter flying over. I don't know who they're looking for, or what they're looking for, but well, of course, just stay live, and you know, it's it's <laughs> live and they're live. As long as it stays in the air, I'm happy. 
<laughs> okay, we'll we'll cut away if we need to. Um, okay. okay, so our uh, Riley wins one of my coworkers here at Digital Trends, and he's a huge Office fan, and he had a couple of questions he wanted me to ask. So I want to get these in. One was, how many crossword puzzles do you think you actually finished while working on the show? That I actually finished? I don't think I actually ever finished any because after you hold that paper in your hand for so long, it gets kind of uh, it's not the greatest quality in terms of you know, the actual inside of it. So it gets sweaty, it gets wrinkled, it gets mushy. And after a while, it looks kind of ugly on camera. So I probably went through over, you know, in a nine year period, I would say it was well over a couple of dozen, I would imagine. That that were actually finished, a couple of dozen actually Well, got no, through. nothing was ever actually finished from beginning nothing ever to finished. end, but that were used. So probably a couple of dozen. Um, one other question here for you. Now, Pretzel Day obviously is a favorite for all of fans of the fans of The Office. But for Leslie David Baker, what do you put on your pretzel? Oh, anything with chocolate and caramel and uh, pecans, that type of thing. Chocolate, caramel, pecans. So there we go. Yes. Well, we've got uh, Leslie David Baker. I'm not sure. If, OK, still got you. So I want to say thank you, you so me. much for joining us here on the you show. I know welcome. that the helicopters are flying overhead. Uh, yes, but they before are. they get <laughs> there, just to tell everybody really quick, could you let everybody know what they can do to help make Uncle Stan help happen? What you can do is go to the UncleStanTheShow.com and you'll see it on your screen at the bottom. Go to UncleStanTheShow.com and you will see what you can do in terms of participating to help get this show back on the air so that you can see the journey of Uncle Stan and his nephew Lucky and his little niece and nephew and his girlfriend and the biker shop. And, you know, please, we ask you, uh, donate. We're a part of television history. We want to continue to be a part of your lives and bring this story and the continuation of Uncle Stan into your lives. So we look forward to hearing from you and tell people about it, donate, and we'll hopefully get on the air. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today on Digital Trends Live. Appreciate it so much. Uh, you're incredible. And uh, we love the character. I would love to see more. And I want to see this happen. And thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. If you want to see more, you know what to do. And we will provide it for you. <laughs> thank you very much. Leslie David Baker right here on Digital Trends Live. That's just awesome. And I know we need to continue on here with the show because we've got more coming up. Uh, but again, that was Stanley, Stanley Hudson. Um, okay, coming up next, we're actually gonna talk about NASA. So something that's pretty incredible that's happening with NASA, they are renaming their DC headquarters after the legendary engineer, Mary W. Jackson. We've got Michelle Farabee here, who's gonna join us next to talk about the impact of Mary Jackson and more. All well, that's coming up right after this with more Digital Trends Live.
Hello, this is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and again, thank you for joining us wherever you are. Hit that subscribe button and share the show. Let other people know about it. And NASA recently announced they're going to be renaming their DC headquarters after engineering legend and pioneer Mary W. Jackson. And here to talk about that and more, we're joined by the Deputy Director of the Office of Strategic Analysis, Communications, and Business Development at NASA Langley. We've got Michelle Faraby. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I love talking about space exploration. Sorry, that's just something that I always enjoy talking about here on this show. And uh, in particular, talking about this, this really big honor that is going to be happening for Mary W. Jackson. And I wanted to talk to you uh, personally, what your experience was like with her and how maybe she helped shape your career. Yes, I'd love to talk about that. I came to NASA in 1983 and Mrs. Jackson was still working um, by that time, I'm not sure if she was still working in her capacity as engineer or if she had moved over to work in the um, Equal Opportunity Employment Opportunity Office. Um, but without me knowing it, she was mentoring me. Um, all of the, the young black uh, that came, um, employees that came on board, Miss Jackson, um, Catherine Johnson, and others would always reach out to us and introduce us and and ask if, if there were any things that we needed and they'd give us advice and guidance and uh, just brought us into the circle. Um, and I can recall that uh, that the group of scientists and engineers and mathematicians that were at NASA Langley when I came on board, they made sure if we were on the research track to that, that we published, they invited us to join the National Technical Association, the local chapter, which is the, long, the oldest um, African-American technical association. And that's where I ultimately published my first uh, journal article and, and went to the conference to present. So, so they were just there just to mentor us and, and to be a safety net for us. Well, uh, with her being such a pioneer, in particular, something that you, you brought up, you know, being a black engineer, and especially at that time, what she was able to accomplish and overcome, you know, a lot's happened, but there's still a lot more to be done, obviously, when it comes to that. And I was wondering for you, what advice you would have that, that people can do to help uh, keep this movement, to keep science inclusive and to bring in, you know, more DEI and people of color? Well, we have so much talent of all colors, races, creeds, religions. Um, and it's just so important that each one of us has an obligation as a human being to always look at who the talent is coming before us and, and make sure that we're reaching out to students, whether they're in elementary school, middle school, high school, you know, encourage um, students to participate in internships and and just be there when, when people are on board um, and make sure that you look not only at people that look like yourselves, or go to the universities that you went to, reach out. And, and because, you know, we have wonderful um, historically black colleges and universities that have beautiful talent and, and do a lot of research in the areas that NASA is working in. So just, you know, look beyond yourselves and, and reach out to someone who might not look like you because, you know, if everybody were the same, we wouldn't have the diversity of thought and a lot of the, um, the, the breakthroughs that we've made throughout the, uh, the nation and, and throughout time have been because we've had people with diverse perspectives that worked on those problems. What advice would you have for young women out there right now who want to you know, get into engineering and, and STEM education and research? Uh, what would you uh, say to them if they were looking for advice? First of all, um, it's very important um, that, that all girls and anyone listening to this just listen to the words that I'm speaking. Someone forgot to tell me that girls are not supposed to be good in math. You can do everything. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a girl or a boy. Um, you can do math, you can do engineering, you can do science. You just have to study hard and take advantage of opportunities to, to participate in internships, participate in student programs that are focused on STEM. Michelle, for you and what you're doing right now at uh, NASA, can you talk to us about maybe one of the projects you're most excited about that you're working on? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the exciting work that's going on in our aeronautics research directorate. Um, the organization that I'm in now, um, we 
we have the news chief folks. We have we do the communications internally and externally, and we work um, with the uh, the center director and his staff to analyze um, and make sure that we're moving forward with our strategy and our mission. But, but then our aeronautics research director, which is one of three main areas that we work in at NASA Langley, uh, we have a um, low boom flight demonstrator project. We are part, have partnered with Lockheed Martin to, to actually fly a, um, an airplane um, that can fly at uh, sonic boom speeds. And we're gonna demonstrate that we can do that over land um, and make a thump sound instead of that long sonic boom, loud sonic boom sound that uh, the Concorde made back in the day. Right now, um, the Federal Aviation Administration does not allow us to fly uh, that fast over land because of uh, the, the noise and um, what it does to our environment. And we, NASA Langley is, and, and NASA, the agency is working to, to develop this airplane and um, to try to prove that we can fly quietly over land. And one of our um, hidden figures, Dr. Christine Darden, who is still living, she was not featured in the movie, but she's featured in the uh, Hidden Figures book. She worked um, on, uh, on sonic boom research um, back at NASA when, when she was there. Wow, that's exciting. What would the ramifications be of that if, if you're able to be successful with that? How would that be used going forward? Well, if we are able to prove that we can do it, then the next step would be to get the um, Federal Aviation Administration to sort of, to allow us to be able to fly fast over land. And then the airline industry would then begin to build planes that can fly that fast. So, you know, if you can imagine being able to leave um, the East Coast and get to the West Coast within two, two and a half hours. Right now, it takes about six. So that would just be groundbreaking wow. um, for us to do that. That's incredible. Um, I want to say thank you, you know, so much, too, for, for joining us to talk about this. I did have one, one last question, if it's okay, if just about space. I wanted to ask your thoughts on... You know, this increasing integration with commercial space programs with more like scientific and national based programs like SpaceX and NASA or like you said, Lockheed and, and, and NASA and things like that. Um, how do you think that's going to play out going forward? And is that a good thing, I guess, for, for space exploration? Oh, it's an excellent thing. I mean, um, just look at what happened just a few weeks ago. We, uh, for the first time in nine years, we had, we were able to, um, to send Americans up to the space station um, from our soil, uh, and and that and that was a that was a partnership that was you know commercial organization did that so so I, it's it's wonderful it's wonderful I mean everything that we do at NASA is is uh, for humankind and to generate uh, use our technologies to create jobs and and to allow it, you know for our taxpayers to for people to have jobs and, and good paying jobs. So uh, that's exactly what we should be doing. We should be doing the research, um, you know, coming up with the ideas and allowing um, private industry to take those ideas and, and create companies and, and keep us moving forward as a nation. Well, I want to say thank you so much for being here with us today to take some time to talk to us. Um, it's very inspiring what you do. I love NASA. I love everything that you are, are working on and uh, really excited to see this plane with the quiet sonic boom uh, happen. And so thank you very much for being here with us on Digital Trends Live. Thank you and stay safe. You too. Uh, all right. That is just awesome. Talking about space, uh, exciting stuff. So, okay. Continuing on here with the show. We've got more coming up. I know I got to keep it going. And up next, we have TBD. What is it going to be about? I don't know. That's what Jess and Adrian are going to let us know about. So stick around back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live.
Hello, everyone. This is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're at and join the show every day that we broadcast, which is every weekday. But it's Wednesday, which means it's time for TBD. And what does that mean? I don't know. That's what our hosts are going to tell us about. Joining us, we have Adrian Warner and Jess Serba. Jess, as usual, hello. How's it going? Hello, Greg. It's great. How are you? I am doing well. Excited for whatever we're going to be talking about. Uh, and that is uh, what I'm going to ask Adrian Warner. Hello, Adrian. So what are we talking about today? Hi, Greg. Uh, so this week's TBD stands for the bonus demo because we're going to be talking about uh, the ongoing hottest events in summer gaming. Uh, they're all taking place online this year, as we all know. So I have to ask you, Greg, are you planning on attending any virtual gaming events this summer? I probably, you know, honestly, I, I never really have before, but now that I've, I'm at home, uh, yeah, I probably will be, but I know there's like a ton of them that are going on, so I don't even know which ones to go to. Oh yeah, buckle up. There's a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, as we know, and as many people know, but for anyone who is not in the know, uh, Summer Game Fest has been underway. It's been going on since May, and um, it's taking place of a a bunch of the spring and summer gaming events that usually people travel all around the world for, such as, you know, uh, GDC, which is supposed to be in March. Uh, E3 takes place every every uh, every year in June. You know, Gamescom in August, et cetera. There's many more. But as coronavirus concerns are still at an all-time high, game uh, summer game fest started back in May and uh, it's taken the place of a lot of these. So it's a really great event because, you know, a lot of these demos that publishers for highly anticipated games can, you know, can hype things up online. Uh, lots of tech demos are going on. And until now, events like the Unreal 5, Real Engine 5 tech demo and uh, Sony's PlayStation 5 event have been highly anticipated and highly watched um, as digital broadcast. So people can still tune in still see what's going on in the gaming world even though they can't be there in person so july has a lot of uh awesome things to tune into and some of the most anticipated events we're going to tell you about uh such as ubisoft forward on july 12th and stadia connect uh, later on july 14th ubisoft is actually uh really excitingly touting a free PC copy of Watch Dogs 2 for anybody who tunes in. So you can get your copy by signing into a Uplay account at any point between the pre-show and the end of the main conference. You can also just, wow. uh, you know, participate in different trivia, yeah, taking place for other, you know, games, um, promo, you know, promo materials and things like that, other bonuses. Um, and then, you know, later on, Stadia Connect uh, will be taking place a couple days later, which is, you know, the streaming service by Google, and they're gonna be sharing the latest features and games coming to their platform. So those are really cool. Those are happening just, you know, this coming next week, but there is also a lot coming the following week. Um, a little further down the line, we're gonna have the developer showcase on July 20th, which is really, really cool. It's essentially a developer showcase that's gonna highlight this year's most anticipated indie and AAA games. Uh, there was a part one that took place in June. Uh, this is essentially an extension of Day of the Devs, which was always an indie game showcase that took place at GDC 
every year. Um, and the second part is going to be taking place in July. And then shortly after that, because there's always more, <laughs> there's going to be the Xbox Game Showcase, which is also, you know, very highly anticipated. That'll be airing on July 23rd. Xbox is going to be debuting all of their first party games at the event. Um, they're going to be showing off a lot of Halo Infinite, which we know is coming down the pipeline. But others, uh, you know, there's a rumored Fable reboot that might be happening. We'll be seeing more of Psychonauts 2, Forza, Gears of War, etc. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be a lot of more interesting uh, news about, you know, their Xbox, Xbox Game Pass and other features of their service. So if you want to tune into all of this, you can do so through several streaming platforms. Uh, you know, you can tune in on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, but they're not the only game in town. There's a lot of other events that take place outside of Summer Games Fest. One's for fans that are uh, a particular game, such as Pokemon Go or Minecraft. And I'm going to let Jess talk about those because those are also hot on the trail. Yeah, they really are, Adrian. So first we'll talk about Pokemon Go Fest 2020. It's the annual gathering for Pokemon Go players. Uh, it'll take place on July 25th and 26th. It's being described as an all new, completely reimagined global event in a virtual format, as it will be exclusively online this year. It's traditionally been held, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at physical locations, mostly in Chicago, uh, but just last year it expanded to Yokohama, Japan and Dortmund, Germany. It had over 600,000 players attend these three physical events last year. It's probably safe to say that the numbers will likely be higher since there is broader access now. Uh, tickets have previously been limited, but they say that they're doing their best to make as many tickets available to as many people and as, well, as many trainers as possible. You can pick up tickets for $14.99, and all the proceeds from the Pokemon Go Fest will be donated to organizations to help fund Black gaming projects and as well as community rebuilding efforts. So uh, Ryan Johnson of Star Wars fame actually just directed a commercial for the fest, which was released on Monday, which was also the fourth anniversary of the game's official launch. If you remember back, I can actually remember like in summer when it all sort of kind of exploded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been four <laughs> years now. Um, as far as the fest wow. in general, I, I know. Uh, as far as the fest in general, you can expect increased Pokemon encounters with over 75 species of Pokemon appearing during the Go Fest uh, in the wild in raids and as uh, special research encounters. Uh, you also have five rotating habitats themed after fire, water, grass, battle, and friendship. Each feature will feature. <laughs> Uh, different Pokemon and challenges, uh, and a global challenge arena that'll give players a chance to work together with trainers from around the world. And each day at Pokemon Go Fest, we'll have a different special research story to enjoy. Uh, next up, we have wow. uh, the Brave Family Block Fest, which is the world's largest music festival, virtual music festival, which is happening in Minecraft. The dates are July 9th through the 12th. It was originally slated to take place June 25th through the 28th. However, the rollout of a long-awaited Minecraft Nether update was announced for June 23rd. So the organizers said that, you know, given the uncertainty that can come directly after a large-scale update like that, it was just wise, basically, to push it out about two weeks. Um, the festival also had a bit of a name change. It was originally named Electric Blockaloo, as the organizers were <laughs> right, as the organizers intending to pay homage to the breakdancing movement captured by the film you know, Break Into Electric Boogaloo. However, the term Boogaloo has unfortunately been co-opted recently um, by an extremist group in the US that is becoming increasingly visible. So they decided it was best at this time to kind of pivot the name a little to Rave Family Block. Uh, the fest in general will feature 65 plus uh, hosted stages and over 950 performers. So it is big. Uh, you'll see artists such as Dead Mouse, Naoki, Paris Hilton, A Track, Grizz, and many more. Um, general admission is $10. And with a $15 VIP add on, you can have access to things such as like secret DJ sets uh, and things like early access, things like that. To join, you just need two things, a spot on the guest list and a copy of Minecraft. 
And you can actually use a unique link from an artist that you like to support. And it'll cover half, over half of your cover charge will actually go directly back to this artist. And you'll still get the full GA admission, which is pretty awesome. Uh, the festival itself in most stages will be set to adventure mode. You can group camp with your friends, really want to go. Uh, they'll also have encore weekends, the three following weekends after the festival. So you can check out sets that you missed, you know, due to the sheer, um, you know, vast amount of sets that there are that you may be missing. Um, and then anything that you, you know, you really loved and you want to revisit, you can do that. So I, I kind of want to go to this one. Wow. I I did do too. Yeah, that is a <laughs> lot going on. I mean, I, just between both of you, I did not know there were that many festivals and things going on online uh, for gaming. So maybe this would be finally what will get me to play Minecraft. I don't know. I'm still, mm, maybe. Maybe I will. You can take. Um, but that is a lot. <laughs> You can take all the friends you make in uh, Pokemon Go and attend the festival with them <laughs> in Minecraft. There you go. All right. I'm in. Um, thank you. That is a lot that is happening right there uh, for gaming festivals. But I know that it's not all that happens on TBD. We also have Kickstop It. So what are we taking a look at today? Oh, I've got a good one for you today, Greg. Um, so <laughs> we're taking a look at a product named Re. Um, it is essentially a uh, growing solution for uh, oh. protein. So you can make your own protein in your house, and that form of protein is bugs. <laughs> oh, God. So grow bugs in your house sustainably. Sustainable protein is the, is the goal with this. And then you can consume them um, in replacement of mm. things like meat or other farmed <laughs> sources of protein um i just this is so like nicely done and it's also been it's it's hit its goal um so they're obviously doing well but it is so bonkers because growing bugs in your house to eat sounds atrocious <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if cover uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's lookalike is telling me to do it. I don't think I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I feel like Adrian oh, is so gross. Like, watching the sausage get made, like watching <laughs> the bugs develop. Um, oh. Uh, and my other thing is, you know, like the one of the the. It, the, it solves the problem, right, of, like, the intensive, like, meat production, overproduction of that, mm -hmm. um, all the farming, all of that. But, you know, I just can't see myself grabbing a bug before I grab a meat substitute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't either. And one of the quotes that I pulled from this video was, mealworms are a great and versatile ingredient due to their subtle nutty taste similar to almonds. I think I'm just going to go for a handful of almonds. I'm good. <laughs> Same. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I mean, bugs right? are all. yeah, sprinkle some bugs on your pizza. No, um, I mean, I appreciate all of the positive things that come out of this. And I'm and anybody else who wants to do this, I fully support. I cannot have bugs uh, growing in my kitchen. No, I just I cannot do it. I have to I have to kick stop it. <laughs> I feel you there. I want to like you know, live vicariously through somebody else's journey who does this. And I'm glad to see that, yes. you know, they're fully funded and that they're succeeding as, you know, a, an attempt at tackling sustainability, but it's a kickstop it for me too. Jeff? Yeah, that's a hard kickstop it for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I 100% I'm, I'm in agreement with both of you. I love that people are doing this. I love that this is an option for people you know, that are drawn to this. I love the sustainability. Uh, it's not for me. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you said, appreciate all they're doing. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, um, to cleanse the palate from bugs, uh, I know we do have our final <laughs> thing here though for TBD. Yes, <laughs> let's take a look at Charlie taking a walk outside. He's probably munching some bugs of his own, but um, it's a lot nicer to look at than larvae. <laughs> let's just say that. Yes, he is. <laughs> Yes, very Ooh, much so. Look at oh, that back reverse. and forth. Back oh, and forth. that's good. Oh, I like it. Yeah. That is a talented dog right there. He really All is. Right. Jess and Adrian, thank you very much. Another successful TBD. Appreciate it. I'll talk to you both soon. Awesome. Bye, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Bye. Uh, all right. 
That, uh, that was great. Charlie always cleanses the palate, as I was saying. So let us do this. Um, this has been a heck of a show. We've had a lot of things happen here on Digital Trends Live today, and that's why you want to hit subscribe so you're here with us every single day. 9 Pacific, noon Eastern, we are broadcasting live, bringing you all of this. And each day is, is a new thing, a new gift for you. There we go. I'll say it like that. That's not in our copy, but here it is. Uh, coming up tomorrow on the show, we will have uh, Lisa Marie Sagara talking about what is going on in the world of gaming, and we'll have all the tech news that you can handle, plus some great guests, and that is just on tomorrow's show. So like I said, hit subscribe, share the show, let other people know about it. Thanks for being here. I'm Greg Nibbler, and I'll be right back here tomorrow with another edition of Digital Trends Live.